Hello everyone, uh, my name is Matt. Um, I'm really excited to be here, hope you're well. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about the speed of change really, the, the privacy landscape, you know, the, the reality we live in. Um, so essentially no one could have imagined the, the last three years, right? Everything has changed, how we live, how we work. And uh, I'd say for most people, how we work relates mostly to uh, working from home rather than working from the office. But for us in this, in this space, in this today here in this room, it's real, it really reshaped our, well, our work, our, you know, uh, the way, the way we, we work with our customers and with our, with our users, with, with everyone. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. Uh, what I'm referring to is uh, uh, the change in customer privacy, really, uh, from various types of uh, laws and regulations that were introduced to different tech platforms making significant changes uh, to, to their policies and, and basically the way they work. Um, how companies now obtain and share user-level data was hugely impacted. Uh, but before we get into detail, uh, first things first, quick intro. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm a solutions architect at Apps Flyer. Uh, my job is to work with uh, customers and prospects to help them solve all the uh, mobile attribution and, and uh, marketing analytics problems. Uh, I'm also a product specialist on the Apps Flyer's uh, product suite. Um, my background is in um, data privacy, data security. I've been working in mobile mobile attribution uh, as well so so basically uh, uh, I've, I've been in the industry for a while I've seen a lot of change I've seen a lot of new trends coming and one thing that I really love at AppsFlyer is how we embrace it all to create solutions that are um, creative and innovative and in case you haven't uh, well, heard much about Apps Flyer. Uh, we are a market leader in mobile, uh, mobile MM, MMP, basically, so uh, mobile attribution and, and uh, marketing analytics. Uh, with over 1,300 employees, uh, 19 offices globally, we're fortunate enough to be um, working with 65% of, of mobile apps uh, players. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so let's get to it. Uh, privacy, uh, we hear about it, we read about it, it's, it's everywhere, it's even in, in billboards as a selling point, right? Apple uses privacy as a key advantage in, in their ads uh, and Google uh, uses, uh, basically, Google promotes videos that uh, show, you know, their users that their searches are actually private. Uh, and this is driving an awareness and behavioral shift in people uh, that will come to define the next year of how we use the internet. Next slide, please. Uh, but the change that led to privacy becoming core to our um, experience on the internet didn't happen overnight, right? It didn't happen suddenly. Uh, and we've actually been having the, the front row seat in, in seeing this change materialize. Um, and the writing was on the wall, right? Uh, I know that because here at Apps we've been investing uh, heavily in, in privacy uh, for many years now. Um, uh, so basically, uh, you know that uh, we've we've not we're not quite out of the woods yet. I, th I think it's quite clear to to everyone at this point. We've seen a lot of activity in different regulatory bodies um, all over the globe, right? We see Google introducing uh, their privacy sandbox that will happen over the next couple of years. We see Apple making changes to iOS and introducing SK Ad, right? ATT. Uh, so so there's a lot of change happening uh, constantly. No one exactly knows how it's all going to play out but when we look at the next three to five years it's clear where we had it and where we had it is that basically user level data um, will be phased out or, or will disappear perhaps the key change basically is around the, the user level data or the device level data um, Back in 2019, the conversation was mainly about what's possible with all the data points that we had with, by, by basically leveraging the uh, user level da data, we were better able to understand customer journeys uh, across different devices, right? And also we were able to build hyper personalized um, paths and funnels to delight those customers. But obviously things have changed since and we will need to 
adapt this uh, to, to this as well. Um, the thing is that regardless of anyone, uh, you know, outside of what, what anyone outside of this room or what this space is thinking, what we're really after is not the customer data, but basically uh, this this just a means to an end, right? It's it's not not what we are really. It's what we use to to delight our customers, but it's not that we want to spy on them, right? And next slide, please. Um, and, and basically, uh, if it wasn't clear until now, uh, this needs to sink in. Unless, um, unless explicitly consented, obtaining and sharing user-level data will be gone very soon. Um, so the impact of this, right, uh, will be uh, is, is certainly being felt already amongst marketers. Um, we face many challenges in the wake of the disappearance of user-level data, uh, especially with the emergence of Apple's CAD network. Um, so, as many of you might know, Apple with uh, iOS 14 uh, decided to to basically um, do a little revolution and and uh, change the way things work and and obviously there is just one post back being sent so it's the way we measure LTV right lifetime value of users has changed completely and uh, there's there's been a yeah 180 degree turn in, in basically how things are working and now uh, in the a uh, worldwide uh, developer conference that was held last month, I believe. Apple announced that actually they will come to free postbacks. There might be some more information that will, that will be uh, available, but at this point it's unclear when the new version of Scan will be implemented, and uh, so the lack of uh, ROI data will still remain a problem until this time. Um, another challenge that we face is the uh, remarketing being very much affected in this new world. So, as many of you might know, in iOS 14, users have opted out or might opt out, and this happens quite a lot, of ad tracking. And this means that adv uh, advertisers have no access to IDFA to work with anymore. And without this identifier, obviously, remarketing becomes um, far more complex and, and challenging. Uh, so, app owners need to use other identifiers um, to encourage user opt-in, uh, such as requesting an email address, right, But or any other form of identification. But the problem related to those is that these identifiers are considered first-party data and therefore adhere to new privacy standards. For example, GDPR, right, obviously there's so much change that has happened um, lately that uh, it's, it's just it's getting more and more complex, right? And obviously each limitation has a workaround. You can still glean insights and add value, right? Um, however, the combination of these factors means that there is fewer data available for advertisers and attribution partners to work with. Um, so, because of all of this that we were talking about, uh, this, basically these changes have forced companies to develop their own approaches, their own standards, right, their own approach to privacy, their own frameworks, their own data silos, their own data flows, right? It means that everything is getting more fragmented and more um, convoluted, really, than it's ever been before. Um, and if anything, persistent identifiers um, served as an unofficial standard before, right? This was our co common language uh, we spoke, but obviously uh, the deprecation of it has caused a, a lack of standard now, really. Proliferation of, of um, data silos and uh, significant added a significant layer of complexity, really. Um, and not we're, so far we're talking about the let's say the marketing landscape, but obviously you know the pressure is growing not only for us but from everywhere, right? We're encountering volatile macroeconomic conditions, conti continued industry changes, um, rising acquisition costs, right? M mounting pressure uh, from many places, and. As far as I understand, no CEO will come to a CMO and say, "Hey, listen, you know, I, I understand your your you know your work, your job got harder. We're going to relax your um, your growth goals." No, it's not going to happen. Simply, right? Obviously, this, the the fierce competition is there to stay, and it's getting fiercer and fiercer. So that's pretty much the uh, reality we have to live in. 
Um, and if we don't change the rules of the game soon, it might turn into a losing game for both basically uh, our industry and the digital society really. So the big question that emerges is how do we continue from here? How do we continue um, to make meaningful experiences for our end users, right? Uh, continue to grow without compromising on user privacy. Can privacy and user experience really coexist? Um, yes, we believe that, that, it, that uh, it can, and so enter the data cleanroom. Um, imagine an ecosystem where users, uh, basically, or everyone can bring their data and uh, collaborate without having to share any user level or raw data with one another. A solution that maintains um, the great value and customer uh, experience, uh, currently enabled by cookies and identifiers, right, uh, and all other user level data, but without any privilege concerns and this is basically the purpose of um, data clean rooms in a nutshell um, so what we're thinking about what we're talking about really is the Switzerland for data of source right uh, DCRs uh, allow secure collaboration between brands and um, various industry players they work with um, Brands can define their own business logic, compliance and, and data governance to ensure that uh, sensitive user level data is kept safe and private and exactly the way it should be, right? Uh, essentially, brands still will be able to calculate um, their campaign KPIs uh, while preserving consumer privacy and delivering experiences customers know and love from before. Um, so, obviously, it all sounds great on paper, right, in theory, but how can these DCRs really help us, uh, as, as in marketers, right? Firstly, they are essential for performance measurement, right? So, um, advertisers can upload, for example, their, da their data into a DCR uh, following a campaign and match up identical key identifiers to conduct an analysis across their customer data. So, this is basically one of the, one of the, one of the key advantages here and the, the key use case is here if we want to measure retention, right, LTV, ROAS, or uh, ARPU. Um, next slide, please. And uh, the second, um, well, use case would be audience segmentation, right? So uh, DCRs also enable granularity um, to a degree that up to recently was simply not possible because of Apple's introduction of uh, ATT. Um, it collects data from authorized third-party sources that are ingested and segmented into a range of behavioral, demographic, and location uh, buckets. And all of this uh, like, um, enables us to leverage and enhance the internal database for more granular and, and better analysis, really. Um, the beauty of, of all of that is uh, that rather than uh, requiring users' personal data to be shared in order to uh, conduct an analysis, a DCR or a data cleanroom enables multiple data sources to be virtually connected through an an anonymized cohorts. Uh, this enables marketers to measure the intersection that exists between the target audiences and the various uh, media audiences. And the third, uh, third thing I wanted to mention is incrementality, right? Uh, so impression data from publishers, audience first, first party response and conversion data can be all tied together uh, at the user level to help you understand the incremental impact of your marketing efforts. Uh, so think about the ability to compare between uh, your tests and mediating groups through A-B testing, right? This is, one, this is a, clearly a game changer. Or more importantly, you can com compare between your exposed and unexposed group. This is, uh, this is, these are basically the, the highlights of DCR. We could talk about this for much longer, but... Um, next slide, please. Yeah, obviously... Um, uh, you know, as Albert Einstein once said, in the middle of uh, every difficulty lies opportunity, right? So there's no denying that there's been a seismic change in, in, uh, in the marketing ecosystem in the last few years, and this has had a very important uh, impact on the, the way uh, marketers do their job, right? Uh, many thought that privacy will cause a demise of um, mobile measurement solutions, but the reality is quite the opposite, right? The, although the challenge brings on, uh, well, the change brings on new challenges, uh, it also brings an opportunity and it, we believe that it's the marketers who adapt to this uh, the quickest that will be the most successful. 
Um, the, bot the bottom line is that uh, permission marketing is the new way forward. Um, company must must forge the relationship with with customers to be able to obtain the ze ideally the zero uh, zero uh, party data uh, to to continue uh, doing businesses and and DCR. So what we just spoke about is just one of the uh, solutions um, that uh, that can help you with that. Next slide, please. Um, if you'd like to find out more about our, our solution, feel free to scan the code now and, and you'll be taken to the, to the relevant page. I just wanted to mention that uh, on Wednesday, is it? First day, we, have a, we will have a basically a draft. You can win a very good uh, trip, the, the, like five star uh, hotel to like, your destination of your choosing. So if you have any further questions about DCR or you want to talk to me or any of my colleagues, feel free to, to find us and grab a drink and just say hi. And thanks a lot uh, everyone for listening um, and that's all from my side. Matt, thank you very much. That was fantastic. I particularly like the statement of being the Switzerland of data. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come through for the app and it's uh, around the DCR for you. Uh, I can combine these two together I hope. First question is, is the DCR basically a sandbox? And the second question is who owns the data in a DCR? Very good questions. So yeah, so they, uh, the DCR is a, a sandbox of source, right? So basically, we take the data from uh, advertisers and we take the, the the data that we have from uh, from our users. We put them together. Who owns the data? I would say no one really. So like basically, every party has their own data, but like makes them available only for a moment to compute the KPIs that we want to see and we, it doesn't really belong with anyone, right? We don't breach any privacy laws by, by accessing this. And, and, and do you, are you responding to inbound inquiries around data clean safe rooms at the moment or is it very much an educational piece that you're taking to market? Are brands asking you to come up with a solution for privacy? Very good question. So we are, you know, like basically we released the product very recently. We're still in early stages, uh, but uh, if there is, you know, like obviously products keep evolving as well, right? DCR that we have now may be very different to what we'll be working with next year, say or in two years time, as we were saying, the the, the pace of change. But uh, but yeah, I encourage everyone to to find out more about our um, about our solution because I think it's very interesting, and come and chat to us. Excellent. Brilliant, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank and also so much. The, the sponsor of our event. So drinks are on Matt come Thursday, everybody. <laughs> of course.